the Boltzmann machine, I assume, assume that they're machine learning too? Yeah. So, uh, more machine learning for this siesta time. Don, I'm sure that you won't be sleepy now. So, let's give an applause to Ricardo Pio. Come on. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I want to talk about some work I did together with my, um, my supervisors, Giovanni and Christophorus, and uh, two collaborators of ours, Robbie and Rob, who are neuroscientists. So uh, there'll be a bit of a neuroscientist flavor to the talk. Um, and I want to talk about modeling a text corpus using deep Boltzmann machines uh, in Python, of course. Uh, so before I start, a few words about myself. Um, I'm a statistician, uh, and I'm about to finish my PhD at Imperial College London. Um, my research focuses mostly on computational statistics, um, and my research is driven mostly by applications in neuroscience. Um, in particular, I do a lot of work with uh, functional MRI, which is basically you put someone in a, in a scanner and you measure blood flow in the brain, and you use that as a proxy for sort of brain activity. Um, and well, I use Python, which is why I'm here. Uh, so today I want to talk about uh, deep and restricted Boltzmann machines, um, and I want to sort of give an introduction to what they are, what are their advantages, disadvantages, um, and sort of tr how, how, how would you train these models, and how would you do sort of model selection on this. And I want to try and motivate all of this by um, an application to text mining. So, so before I sort of start talking about uh, the, the, or describing Boltzmann machines, I thought I would give some motivation into why you'd want to model a text corpus. So, so today, or at this conference, we've seen examples of sort of recommender systems or uh, search engines where you sort of have text as input and need to try and model this text, right? So there's tons of applications as to why you'd want to model uh, text. But actually, in our work, we had a very sort of specific motivation. And this was uh, based on some work we, we did recently, which uh, we, we sort of quite provocatively named the automatic neuroscientist. So in a traditional, uh, fMRI or neuroscience experiment, the way it works is a neuroscientist will design a task, say tapping your fingers or watching some videos, and then you put someone in the scanner uh, and you observe the, the brain activations. So the mapping is going from task to um, activations, right? Whereas the, what the neuroscientists are really interested in is going the other way. So they want to they wanna choose a very specific brain region and then they want to automatically learn <coughs> the tasks which act, maximally activate this. Um, to sort of put this more into a more commercial context, if you're sort of doing uh, web design, you want to, ch when you sort of change things on your website and you do sort of A-B testing, you play around with the, the config configuration of your website, and what you see is sort of the churn rate or the bounce rate. But what you actually want is you want to maximize the bounce rate and automatically choose these parameters to do that, right? So this was sort of the framework we were in. Um, where instead of trying to maximize bounce rate, we were trying to maximize sort of brain activation in a very specific brain region. And so we have a, a paper, which is it's actually open access, so you can download it. Um, and what we did, we, we chose a very specific brain region, and we were able to sort of tune a very specific task and sort of tune the hyperparameters of that task to sort of get maximum uh, brain activation in a certain region. And so we were quite excited that this worked, and we thought, well, okay, since we can do it for one task, wouldn't it be great if we were a bit more ambitious and we did it for loads of tasks? Or wouldn't it be great if we took every single task that was ever proposed in sort of the neuroscientific literature and we automatically searched these tasks in real time uh, in a scanner? So this is, this is where this sort of work came from, right? We said, what if we collected the text of all the neuroscientific papers that had ever been written um, and we somehow studied these texts to sort of distill out the key tasks which people have been studying? And then uh, instead of you choosing a task, you would choose a specific brain region and then we would automatically search these tasks in an, in an intelligent way um, to learn the task which resulted in the maximal activation. Um, of course, we're not the first guys to think about this. There was a paper in 2011 which sort of did exactly this. Um, and they went and they sort of collected all the text for about 10,000 neuroscientific papers. Um, and in addition to the text, they also got the brain activations, right? So for each paper, you had all the text, and also you had in a standardized space the brain activation regions, the brain regions which had been sort of scientific, uh, statistically significantly activated. And so this, this was like a great starting point for us. Uh, and we actually we use, we use pretty much the same data set. And if, actually, if you want to play around with this data set, it's, it's, a, it's available for free. So if you just go to neurosynth.org, uh, you can download all the text and all the um, corresponding brain activation. So instead of using the full text, we, we just use the, the abstracts. Um, 
for each for each uh, paper, which we, we we thought was sort of contained all the relevant information. And so this is this is like a sample entry, right? So here you have you have an abstract or sort of the first bit of an abstract, uh, and you can see that this is a this is a task to do with like episodic memory, and it was a sort of verbal associative encoding task. Um, and so th these are sort of the, the keywords we'd be looking for, right? Um, and so this, this is what will sort of feed into our algorithm um, to try and sort of learn a hierarchy across all tasks. So, so given, given so sort of 10,000 um, abstracts like this, we wanted to sort of end up with, with two main goals. The first was to try to sort of cluster documents together. So documents that are very similar or uh, abstracts that are very similar, we want to sort of uh, put them together. Uh, and so inherent in this is sort of defining some sort of distance across documents, right? So um, whilst there's sort of very intuitive notions for distance with, with uh, vectors, uh, when you're trying to take distance across words, it becomes, or across text, it becomes a lot more difficult, right? Um, because they don't live in a, in a standard Euclidean space and sort of the traditional methods sort of fall apart. And so in order to do this, what we actually wanted and what the main goal of this work was to sort of extract a low dimensional embedding uh, or what people sometimes call semantic representations for each document. And that means effectively take each document and map it from a bunch of words into some sort of high dimensional vector space, um, which sort of lives in some sort of Euclidean space. And then once you have this, you can take distances, you can uh, measure similarity, you can do whatever you want. So this was, this was sort of the crux of, of what we were trying to do. Um, and as hopefully I can convince you today, uh, Boltz machines are one way of doing this. There's a, there's a whole sort of, NLP is a huge, huge, uh, huge sort of area, but uh, Boltz machines are one way which you can do this. So I know that it's sort of a Sunday afternoon, and I don't want to sort of get stuck into things uh, without sort of giving you some motivation to where we're going. And this, is, this was sort of like what we were trying to get towards, right? So on the left here, you have each dot in this plot is a, is a, is a document, so it's an abstract for a paper. Um, and what we've got here is each paper has been transformed into a high dimensional vector space, and then we sort of shrunk in this back down into a two dimensional plot so that, we can, so that I can show it here. So you can think of this as sort of putting each, each document into sort of some 50-dimensional space, and then I've just done a slightly fancier version of PCA to put this back down into a two-dimensional space that you can see here. Um, and so you can see we then ran some sort of really basic clustering, so I think I ran k-means on this, uh, and you can see some clusters forming here. Um, and actually, if you then take the documents in that cluster, uh, and see the associated brain activations with those documents, you can see that there's, there's, there's very clear patterns, right? So if these clusterings were sort of totally meaningless, you would see sort of activations here all over the brain. But what you see here is, for example, cluster six here uh, seems to be associated very clearly with the motor region, right? So you, you, so you see the motor areas uh, um, being flagged up. So going back to our sort of motivating problem, if someone wanted to activate motor regions, you might say, okay, well, I've got this cluster here, which seems to do that quite well. You should try and consider tasks that were described in these documents here, right? Or, you know, if you looked at uh, cluster three, where you sort of have the amygdala being um, activated, um, you might say, okay, well, if you wanted to um, study that brain region, you might, look, you might just consider these, these, uh, these documents here. Okay, so how, how did we get to this, this plot? Um, so, I want to start by talking about restricted Boltzmann machines, which you can sort of think of as a special case of deep Boltzmann machines, uh, and then I'll, then I'll sort of move on. But before I introduce them, I just want to make clear what, what their advantages are, right? So Boltzmann machines are unique in that they're, they're, they're generative models. So uh, you're actually learning a distribution over the, the data. And this is cool because you can then sample, you can then generate samples or dream new, new, uh, new um, new data sets, right? So if you, if you learn a good uh, generative distribution, you can then generate more data if you wanted to. They're fully unsupervised, which suits our needs. Um, and actually, this, this fully unsupervised um, aspect of them, Boltzmann machines are often used as sort of pre-training for neural networks. So if you, have, if you have a small labeled data set, but a quite large data set which is unlabeled, you can sort of try and learn the distribution over the whole unlabeled data set and use that as a sort of pre-training um, for, for your supervised task. And so people typically take bolts machines and stack them together to sort of form deep belief networks or deep bolts machines, which are sort of bolts machines with more hidden layers. And these, these are quite nice because you're able to sort of learn features of features. So as you sort of go higher up in your hierarchy, the, things, the, the, the features that are being picked up by your networks are sort of more abstract. And, um, and this is what sort of gets people excited, right? Because uh, you're able to sort of learn really complicated uh, patterns in your data. The disadvantages of Boltzmann machines in general are that training isn't straightforward, 
Although in the case of a restricted Boltzmann machine, training is, is not that difficult, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll convince you of that today. Um, but the main, the really big problem with Boltzmann machines in general is that uh, model selection or, or model comparison is really difficult. Um, because actually, you only learn things up to a normalizing constant, and then we'll discuss that in a bit, but learning that normalizing constant is, is quite tricky. So Boltzmann machines are a special case, oh sorry, restricted Boltzmann machines are a special case of Boltzmann machines which are a, a sort of undirected graphical model which help you learn a distribution over your uh, data set. So if we assume we have um, visible binary units for now, uh, and you want to learn a distribution of these binary units, you might assume that there's some latent uh, hidden units which also affect their distributions, right? And so what Boltzmann machines let you do is that they let you learn very flexible uh, models over your, over your data set. And the way they let you do this is by um, defining pairwise potentials across your hidden and visible units. Now, whilst you're able to learn very expressive and very flexible models, because you have all these uh, pairwise potentials across both hidden and visible units, training Boltzmann machines is actually really difficult. Uh, and so, in restricted Boltzmann machines, we, we sort of uh, restrict the graphical structure um, so that it's bipartite, so that all these dashed edges here are sort of set to zero. They're not allowed to be in the model. And what that means is that um, the visible units conditional on your hidden units become independent and vice versa. And actually, this is what makes training Boltzmann machines really, really straightforward in practice. So for now, I'm just going to assume that the visible units are binary. So think of these as sort of like uh, pixels in a black and white image. And then I'll discuss how you can extend this to sort of text or, or you know, Gaussian visible units. Um, in actual fact, Boltzmann machines can deal with sort of any exponential family visible units. So they're very flexible in that sense. So, uh, Boltzmann machines are parameterized by uh, these, these weights, right? These weights specify the dependencies across the units. Um, so you can think of these weights as sort of uh, summarizing some sort of measure of correlation across these units. So if this weight is large and positive, that means that if this visible unit is on, then it's going to really encourage this, this hidden unit to be on as well. And so um, the way learning works uh, in a Boltzmann machine is you try, you try to maximize the likelihood over your, your data set. And this is defined as um, the exponential of, of your energy. So these are sort of statistical physics models um, where you, try to, you, you sort of try to minimize energy. Um, and actually, we'll see in a second, this likelihood term is available in closed form precisely because we sort of in, impose these restrictions. Right? So imposing these sort of restrictions on the graphical structure leads to two sort of key um, properties which makes training Boltzmann machines uh, sort of somewhat straightforward. The first is the conditional independence. So given the hidden units, uh, all the visible units are conditionally independent. So if you, wa if you wanted to sample the visible units given the hidden units, uh, all you would have to do is sample each of them independently, right? So, it, it, so it, this turns into like selecting or sampling a bunch of univariate random variables. Uh, and so you can do this really quickly uh, and easily. And it's the same for the hidden units. So if you want to sample one layer conditional on, on the other layer, this is, this is very easy. And actually, these distributions you actually have access to in closed form. Um, so um, recall that each of the units is binary, so it's either on or off. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the distribution of the, of the ith visible unit conditional on your hidden layers is just, a, is just a Bernoulli random variable with this sort of probability of being on, right? So in order to sort of sample your visible units given your hidden units, or, or vice versa, all you have to do is sort of calculate uh, the sort of input function or the activation function, and then um, you just sort of sample uh, a binary random variable with this, with this probability. So, I mean, if you, if you wanted to do this in Python, it would just be two lines, right? So all you have to do is calculate, uh, so given some vector of hidden units, you just, um, this, this dot product calculates this sum for all the visible units, uh, you then pass it through your sigmoidal activation function, uh, and that basically squishes it down to between zero and one, and then all you do is you sort of sample binary random variables, oh, sorry, uh, Bernoulli random variables with, uh, with this sort of activation probability. And actually, this is pretty much training restricted Boltzmann machines just boils down to doing this a bunch of times. Um, so, so, so this is why um, it's not that tricky. So, so training. Um, <clears throat> so since we... Um, so training proceeds by sort of uh, trying to maximize the log likelihood of your visible, uh, visible units, right? So unfortunately, uh, this log likelihood is really complicated and it's, it's not closed form. 
So the way training works is by iteratively calculating the, the, the gradient, taking one step in that, case, in that direction, and then calculating the gradient again. Um, so this is this in a gradient descent framework. Now, <clears throat> in, in the case of restricted Boltzmann machines, uh, this, this derivative here, so the derivative of the like likelihood respect to your parameters w, is, uh, turns out to be the sum of two expectations, right? So the, the first of these expectations is with respect to the distribution of the hidden units given your visible units. And um, so this, because of, this, because of the, the, the graphical structure of the, of the restricted Boltzmann machine, you can actually calculate this in closed form, right? So you can, given some visible units, you can calculate the hidden units um, <coughs> in closed form. The second distribution is the one that causes some trouble because it's, based, it's over the distribution of the hidden and the visible units simultaneously. And actually, this, this you don't know, um, and this is what you have to sort of approximate. And this is why instead of just being absolute maximum likelihood, it's, it's approximate maximum likelihood. So, as I said, the, um, the first expectation, you simply sample the, hit, the hidden units given your visible units, and this is just a bunch of uh, Bernoulli random variables again, where you sort of adjust the, the activation for each one. Um, and for the second, the second expectation, you, try, you sort of approximate this via MCMC. Uh, and basically what this, what this what it boils down to is you just sample the hidden given the visible and the visible given the hidden a bunch of times. So if you iterate this k times, you, you actually you, you, you converge to the, distribution, to the joint distribution. But in practice, doing this for large k is quite computationally expensive, so people typically do this for a small number, for a small number of loops. And actually, it's been shown that k equals 1, which, which you know, people that do MCMC will, will tell you this is like a really bad approximation. But uh, it's been shown in practice that this, this sort of leads to good, good, um, good, good performance. So, so, so typically, all you do is you just sample the, the visible given the hidden and the hidden given the visible units, and you just take that as, a, as, as your estimate. So if you were to do this in sort of Python, it would just be a bunch of like five lines of code, right? So the first expectation, you're, you're estimating it here. So you, just, uh, you, you have the visible units as your input, uh, and you just calculate the, the sort of the activations for each of your hidden units, and then you sample them. And then you just take the inner product. This is, your, this is sort of the first term, the positive term. And then in the, in the second term, you, you, again, you, you then you sample the, the hidden units again, but given this sort of imaginary sample of, of, of so you sample the visible units given this imaginary sample of hidden units, and then you sample the, the hidden units again, and this is this is sort of like one step in that in that uh, iterative process. If you were to, if you wanted to do this more times, you could sort of loop over here, and you would get a better approximation, but it would be sort of uh, expensive. And then the, this difference here is is, is your, your gradient step, and so you would just sort of iterate this a bunch of times until you got some some sort of convergence. Um, of course, one thing I want to make clear is that the number of parameters in this model is is huge, right? So you you have one edge between each Visible unit and each hidden unit. So the number of parameters is 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 actually lo is larger than, but it's of the order number of visible units times number of hidden units. So it, this can be like in the thousands or in the in the millions if you have a large a large network. So it's really important to sort of try and correct for overfitting. And so the the simplest way of doing this in practice is to just use what's called dropout. And what this does is it it ra it uh, in your sort of gradient descent steps it randomly um, drops hidden units. So what, what this encourages is it means that the hidden units should learn patterns in your data, uh, and they should be robust to patterns in your data. They shouldn't be trying to learn patterns across other hidden units. So you're trying to, you're trying to remove the dependencies across hidden units. And so actually implementing this is really easy, right? All you do is at your, at your gradient descent step, you just randomly choose a hidden unit, and if, you, and if this, this unit is chosen, then all these weights are sort of dropped to zero. And it, it's, as, it's, as, it's as if you had built a network with just two hidden units instead of three. Okay, so so far I've been discussing how to model sort of binary visible units, but in, in this example we want to model text. And so one way of modeling text is to sort of treat it as, as if it was binary. So you could, you could model, say, the sentence, the ability to bind information, blah, blah, blah. You could model, you could model it in, this, in, a sort of in, a, in an incidence matrix, right, where you would have a one here because ability is the second word to appear, and then uh, there, there would be zeros in, all this ro in the rest of this column because... Uh, this, this word has already appeared. Um, and, and this is good because it lets you model order, right? So this, this, this representation of, of the text uh, maintains the order of the text, right? Um, the downside is you've actually, you represent a sentence as, or a document as this massively large and sparse matrix, right? So you, you have as many rows as you have uh, words in your vocabulary and as many um, columns as you have words in your text, but actually, 
each, each column is only ever going to have one non-zero entry. So you have, you have massive sparsity. And, and if you were to treat each of the entries in this matrix as a visible unit, then the number of parameters in your, in your bolting machine would, would be huge, right? And actually, the number of times each of these, each of these units is actually switched on would be quite small. Uh, so this is, this is a really wasteful way of training a, a Boltzmann machine. Um, so what people typically do when they're trying to model text is to just, instead of sort of, sort of give up on the order, so to sort of um, not model the order directly, and instead just model the, the number of times a word occurs, right? So you model the word counts. Uh, this is sort of like a bag of words model. And so this is a much more parsimonious approach, and, and you, you sort of don't have this sort of sparse matrix, but you sort of lose the ability to generate uh, ordered text. And, and this was the approach we, we took here, right? So the visible units um, stopped being binary and they, they, they became counts, right? So, so this, this visible unit would, would correspond to the number of times this word occurred in, in, in the document. Um, and so since, since the visible units are no longer binary, their, their conditional distribution changes, but it's still, it's still very simple. It's, it's what's called a softmax. It basically means you calculate the probability of this word being chosen and then you normalize for all the other words um, and so if you were to sample words from this, all you would do is just uh, sample a, mul a multinomial distribution with, with these parameters. Uh, but everything else, all the other properties in training uh, for the Boltzmann machines is unchanged, right? So um, you, you can still train in the same way and everything else uh, falls out. So now the, the extension to deep Boltzmann machines. So uh, as with RBMs, you sort of have this bipartite layer. Uh, but now you sort of have more layers of hidden units, right? So you sort of build the hierarchy upwards. Uh, and so what, what, what sort of the, the, the top level un units are doing is they're learning representations about your hidden units, which are learning representations about, about your data, right? So this lets you learn sort of really complicated uh, data distributions. Um, and again, they're sort of energy-based models. So, so you have these, these, these weight vectors which sort of um, define the pairwise potentials between sort of the, the, the visible and the hidden and the, the, pair, the other two layers of hidden units. Um, but training these models is, is somewhat trickier, right? Because um, again, the, the, the derivative of the log likelihood uh, sort of decomposes into two expectations. Um, and the first expectation is, is actually um, with respect to the distribution of the two layers of hidden units given your visible units. And so you no longer have this in closed form. Uh, and so what happens is you, you, you have to sort of approximate this using sort of variational inference. Um, and actually what, what it boils down to is you sort of say, okay, let me model each of these hidden units as an independent uh, Bernoulli random variable, and I want to try and learn the, the parameter for that random variable, which sort of uh, minimizes the distance between that distribution and the, the whole distribution. And it, it, what it boils down to is just iteratively applying the, the steps of uh, just training a, a restricted Boltzmann machine. And then for the second distribution, we have to take um, the, the, the joint distribution with respect to all uh, the units in our model. Uh, and again, we have to sort of use MCMC for this. Uh, and so th the approach is somewhat similar to, to, the, to, to the Boltzmann machine, except you don't restart uh, the Markov chain at each iteration. You sort of, you sort of maintain it and you iterate it forward. Um, and this, this, sort of, this sort of helps with the whole burn-in issue. So you don't have to, you would have to do so many steps. Okay, so one of the problems with these models is because they're so complex uh, and sort of the, the, the distribute or sort of the, the properties of the objectum function are, are that it's not convex and it's not well behaved and there's loads of local minima. And so actually initializing the model to uh, a good sort of initial guess for your parameters W is really important. So if you don't initialize the weights properly, you'll sort of, you'll sort of you'll get very bad performance. And so pre-training is, is quite a big thing in sort of neural networks, and especially in deep Boltzmann machines. So the, the most popular pre-training algorithm is to just sort of build your stack of uh, restricted Boltzmann machines upwards. So you build the first layer, and then you would, you would take the data as input and take a bunch of samples of these guys and then treat these guys as data to build your next layer. Um, and this, this, this gives you sort of initial guess, an initial guess for what the weights should be, um, and uh, you would then take those weights and apply the the general um, training algorithm. So back to the exciting stuff of actually seeing results. So the way, uh, so uh, we took the abstracts for about 10,000 neuroscientific publications. Uh, so the average length of each document was about 80 words. Uh, we had a vocabulary of 1,000 words. Um, and then we trained a 
We trained a deep Boston machine with two layers of 50 binary units each. Uh, and so, yeah, we did pre-training as described with uh, just standard training for a restricted Boston machine with one step of um, Gibbs sampling at each step. Uh, we used dropout where each hidden unit was removed with uh, probability 0.1. So, um, what do we get? So, what we got in our model is you had, if you provide, you could provide as input text, and this would sort of send, if, and if you then sent that text upwards into the Bolton machine, you would get a, you would be able to represent this text in a sort of high dimensional vector space, right? Uh, of like sort of probability activations for the top, le top level units. So this is a slide where we represented each word in our sort of 1,000 word vocabulary in this high dimensional vector space. And then we just did some really simple clustering on these words. And you can see that there's actually uh, words with similar semantic meaning are sort of clustered together, right? So here you have uh, things to do with memory, uh, retrieval. Uh, the hippocampus is the brain region associated with memory. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is because this whole uh, model was trained just on neuroscientific literature, there's going to be a, a whole bunch of small quirks which are only uh, specific to sort of the, the literature. So this cluster is to do with sort of language. This one to do with sort of uh, age and how the development of the brain. And here you have a cluster to do with sort of like disorders, right? So disorders, schizophrenia, um, some sort of syndrome. So you can see that the embeddings we're learning for each word sort of makes sense. And, you, and if you were to take distances across these words, then you, you would get to sort of things that make some sense. And so what we have here again is uh, we've embedded each of the words in, in this high dimensional vector space and then tried to sort of uh, project that down into a, into a 2D space to plot. Um, and it looks like a bit of a scatter, but if you zoom in, so for example here at the, in the top, uh, top box, you see that uh, these are all words to do with emotions. So you have sort of happy, sad, um, the amygdala, which is the brain region which sort of um, controls emotion. Um, uh, on, on the left here in, in panel C, you have sort of the hippocampus, which is to do with like recall and memory, um, and sort of memory, working memory and these type of things. And over here you have sort of a child and development and all these type of things. So you can see that the, the, the word vectors that are being learned sort of make, make some sense. Um, another way to check that these, the, the models are learned a good distribution of the data is to do what's called a, a sort of a one-step reconstruction. So you provide, you provide a word as input, uh, you go up the model, you learn the hidden, the hidden units, and then you come back down. Uh, and so you see what, uh, what words are sort of... Um, what words are similar given the hidden representation you've learned for that word. Uh, and so you, you should get words that are similar, right? So if you, if you give it memory as input, uh, and then you try and see the, the reconstruction words are sort of memory, uh, working is here because working memory is a really popular task in neuroscience. If you were to train this on a different text corpus, uh, I wouldn't expect that. Um, things like face, you get face faces. Um, so th these sort of things sort of make some sense. So the cool thing about these models is that sort of the hidden layers are discriminative, right? So this is what people get excited about, that when you can actually interpret what the model is doing and what it's learning in a totally unsupervised way. Uh, and so in our case, actually, if the hidden layers we found to be somewhat discriminative. And so they were sort of picking up on topics in, of the literature. So what we did here is we sort of, um, as input, we just, we just activated one of the hidden units and set all the other ones to zero, and then worked our way back down the, the, the Boltzmann machine. And what you get is you get that the units are sort of specific to very specific uh, topics in the literature, right? So for example, if, if just the fourth unit was activated, then you get things relating to age. Uh, if just the 38th unit was activated, then you get sort of uh, reading or phonological or language tasks, right? Um, and so th this, is, this is sort of quite cool. Yep. Uh, and finally, we get to sort of the picture which I showed you at the beginning, where each, each uh, document is sort of clustered uh, here. And um, we can see that the cluster sort of uh, represents some sort of um, task-specific things. So that's actually all I have. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and questions? OK, oh, uh, thanks for your talk. It was super interesting. I really like it. Uh, I just had one question. Uh, I understand that if you want to find this equilibrium uh, y and you have a really uh, big magnitude of connections, you will take a lot of matching time. Mm -hmm. Is it correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so this was uh, a thousand visible units um, and then two layers of 50 hidden units, which 
sort of by things that other people do, it's really small. And even so, like I trained it on this laptop, but it was like three nights of you know, or three days of you know, melting the machine. So yeah, yeah, it uh, it takes some time. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then a second question related with that: uh, If you want to scale that, and maybe if you wanted to use it with images, is there any way to do it, or any parameters you can do, or something? Yeah. So so. Um, if you want to do it with images, it's, it's tricky. But the, the good thing is other people have done similar things, and um, they've made their networks available online. So they've put all their weights and stuff online. So you, could, you can download that and use that as a sort of a warm start. Uh, and so, so that, going back to the pre-training thing, um, people have sort of put their pre-trained networks available f for free. You, can, you download those, and then you use those as sort of a warm start for your task. And that, that sort of helps massively, yeah. Yeah. More questions? Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you compared this method to any other topic modeling approaches, like uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, or something like that. Thanks. Uh, I, I personally didn't. Um, so the reason why we, we, we did this in the first place is because the flexibility of Bolton machines and being able to model uh, different modalities of data, so text and, say, images at the same time, that's what got us into it, right? So here we've just done it on text. But the dream in this work was to sort of do text and images at the same time. Uh, and that's something that with LDA you can't do without sort of proposing a totally new model. Um, but in, in the literature, uh, the people have done comparisons between these models, um, and they, they're similar. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I have a preference for this because I've, I've worked with this, and I haven't worked with LDA, but uh, I, I, they're, they're very similar. Thank you. I, I was just to, to, to ask you a similar question. Is a, you, you have a model topics for papers in, in neuroscience, but how general is this, mo this network that you have built? Do you think you can catch this network and bring it to another topics in, in, in science? Uh, yeah, good, good question. Uh, I would say probably not, right? Um, because this has been trained on the neuroscientific literature, and. If you've ever tried to read a paper from a different sort of literature, you can see that there's a whole different language there, right? So for, for example, here in the sort of the reconstruction of memory, the second word is working, right? And this is because working memory is a really popular task. But in any other literature, you wouldn't associate the words working and memory together. Um, so if you, were, if you were to sort of try and extend this to a different literature, I would suggest, I mean, maybe you could, I, I would suggest sort of scraping the data again and starting again. Yeah, because I, I mean, I wouldn't expect this to generalize further than this. That, that was uh, what, what I was about to say because I know about the people that does cancer research. Mm -hmm. They they have computers that, since the literature of drug research is among us, they have systems to automatically read the papers of new drugs and then see which drugs may apply to what kind of tumor. I don't know if you knew about that. Yeah, I know, it's, I know it's a big thing because uh, drug, drug research is, is tons of money goes into it. And as you say, like the literature is just exploding and no one can keep track of it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want more references in the bibliography or of, of your thesis, I don't know. OK. <laughs> more questions? OK, so let's thank the speaker for this great talk.